Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we're bringing in Jennifer Wadella. Jennifer, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I am excited to be here. I uh, I am I'm really happy to have you on the show. We first met at uh, what was it? That conference, I think. I, yeah, I think it was that conf. Yeah, that conf back in in a few years back now. Um, it was an absolute blast. It was super fun. We uh, that it was at a hotel that was full of like elephant statues and, and yes, weird tiki bars. They're all called the Kalahari, right? It's like I the Kalahari so, yeah. chain because Code Mash is in Ohio and they do it at one of the Kalahari. Oh, okay. Too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, it was my first time out there in the what is that place? The Wisconsin Dells. I I ate cheese curds and oh, it was great. Oh, cheese curds are delicious. Yeah, you know, the I, only problem with that conference is it's a pain in the ass to get to. There's no good airport so to fly far into. Out. You gotta like fly into Madison, and then everybody's trying to carpool on this two hour drive out to the Wisconsin Dells. Um, it was yeah, it was really really fun. Um, but anyway, so for for folks who weren't at that conf or aren't familiar with your work, do you want to give us a little background on yourself? For sure. Um, so my name is Jennifer Wadella. I'm the director of Angular development at a consulting company called Batovi. Uh, we're a boot boutique JavaScript consulting company. We've typically always specialized in the front end, but we tend to be very good at JavaScript. And so we've started actually doing a lot of node work as well as UX work. Um, so I lead our Angular team on Angular projects, uh, which means I don't write as much code as I used to, which is a little depressing, but I still get to review pull requests for my team and like somewhat be involved. So that's super fun. Um, I do a lot of conference speaking uh, when it like in person when it's not a pandemic. I guess I've done a fair amount of like virtual conferences, which is just not the same. At all. <laughs> I well, yeah, I'm I'm feeling uh, I'm really feeling the urge to do some just any kind of in person hangouts. Like I, uh -huh. I yeah, I uh, I'm excited. I I get my first vaccination shot today, and I cannot wait. I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm just counting down. The, I, we, I was talking to my partner about this. We were just like, all I want to do is sit at a bar. Like, I just want to sit at a bar. That's that's it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like people in the chat, tell us the first thing you're going to do once you're vaccinated. But I'm, I had shot number two on nice. last. No, this Monday, last Monday, last Monday. Oh my God, COVID time has no meaning. But all I wanted to do is I wanted to go and wander around a home goods store. Not with any inclination to like buy anything, but just to wander around a store for no reason. And and I did that this week and it was, uh, it was yeah, a sense of normalcy. And of course I miss my friends and I want to go out to bars and stuff, but that was like the really random obscure thing. That yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I hadn't even did, I didn't thought of that. Right. No, but that's for for real. Like that was a thing that we used to. It was like a, a weekend activity. We would go, we would get a coffee, and then we'd go wander around like the the antique shops and the. Yeah. And it was like we never buy and stuff. It was just a thing to do that wasn't looking at a computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's nice to have that like just separation and and like I don't know if anybody's like ever tried to furnish a house or anything, but it's like really hard to go and like set up for a specific thing. But mm. like when you're doing this like perambulating, like strolling, that's when you're gonna find the perfect perfect thing. Like I have this bourbon shelf that I have at my house, and it houses all my whenever I travel, I buy a cookbook from the region, nice. and then it's like my bourbon shrine. So it's like that perfect piece that I just randomly found. While wandering oh that's um, so cool yeah i'm seeing yeah. some good stuff good stuff in the chat people are gonna go take the kids downtown yeah mm. date nights <laughs> live concerts yes in person D D. that yeah i've been playing a remote game of uh not D D, but um rogue trader which is like a it's like space D D. um and it's really uh, fun uh, and it lets me play with friends from like texas and stuff uh but nice. i do miss the in-person game nights we'd all like bring snacks and stuff uh, oh, Ben says he's going to bring me a bunch of trees. I, I want to hang out, Ben, but I swear to God, if you show up in my house with trees, <laughs> the, there's a, a running joke there uh, for those of you who don't understand what just happened, that my partner has been slowly converting our house into a greenhouse and uh, is now trying to talk me into buying a tree farm. And I'm just, I'm, I'm like, I'm done with trees. We, we have enough trees. No, <laughs> no. So I too have become a like pandemic crazy plant lady. <laughs> um, like it's, it's curbed a little bit. Um, but like actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten plants in my office right now. Um, and there was this great subreddit or there's a great Reddit thread and I don't remember what it was, but it was some guy and he's like, 
my wife keeps buying house plants. How do I make her stop? And like all the crazy plant ladies just like descended on his ass and it was great. So I'm sorry. I'm team your partner here. You can get no anti-tree support. See, from me. I tried to, I tried to rally support on Twitter and it went very much in the opposite direction. <laughs> I, I was like, please help me. I have nowhere to live. There are only plants. And everybody was like, deal with it. Buy more tables. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's see. I bet if you got a tree farm, you could get at least three more video production toys. That's true. Maybe that's what I do is barter. I can buy gear if, if I let Marissa get uh, trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yep. Okay. So, so I think, uh, I mean, we could just talk about this all day. This would actually be a oh, lot of so fun. Oh, so true. Okay. But, <laughs> like, ooh, focus. But, um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about what we're actually here for, which is, you know, you mentioned you're a, an angular specialist. Yes. Um, and so I've done a bit of angular, uh, you know, I, I work with Tara Minixic is on, on my team at Netlify. And so every once in a while we pair on stuff. Um, she's been on the show to teach a little bit, but I'm definitely like not familiar with angular. I would, I would mm -hmm. say that it's a, it's, it's a framework that I can use if I have to. Um, mm -hmm. and one of the things that always kind of fascinates me about it is that it's very different from what I'm used to in in other languages and and um mm -hmm. the, probably the thing that fascinates me the most about it is that it's it's kind of like a you don't write as much code as you generate um at least when you're kind of scaffolding things out mm -hmm. which is fascinating to me so um i'm always just kind of curious on the take like i i, I assume that this is your preference since you're an angular mm -hmm. expert how like what draw what drew you to that style of of coding well, I'm going to say like when I started my career, um, it was at that time where I was classified as a front end developer, right? Because mm -hmm. like I grew up on web, on GeoCities building web pages or whatever. And then, you know, right as my career was taking off, it was this transition where the definition of a web developer was changing from implementing like a Photoshop file in HTML and CSS and maybe like a sprinkling of jQuery to start to building single page applications. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of like my first um, adventure was with Backbone. JS. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I was at a marketing agency at the time. And so there was a, a very rapid progression of, of projects and prototyping. And so I was able to like get my hands dirty in a lot of different things. Um, like did a little bit of knockout. Um, trying to think if there's anything other else big I did, but um, this was right around the time that, you know, Google had jumped in this game and dropped AngularJS. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a couple startups coming into town. A lot of them were rocking AngularJS. So I went over to one of those and kind of just really, I, I knew all the struggles from Backbone um, that like dealing with shadow views and like all sorts of drama there. And of course, like having to learn on the fly. And so going into Angular from that, there were a lot of problems that were solved in a lot of architecture that was provided. Um, and I was also like, I'm in Kansas City and we are a very .NET heavy town. And so mm. I feel like a lot of times when you have .NET on the back end, Angular was a very common choice for pairing. Um, and so it wasn't like I necessarily like sat out to say, I'm going to be an Angular developer. It's just kind of like where my career led me. Gotcha. Um, and, you know, figuring out how to be successful and operate in that environment. Um, that being said, like when I jump around different frameworks, I'm like, ew, I have to generate, like I have to literally do like touch and then a file name if I want to create a new file. <laughs> um, and it's funny, like how I, I'm not going to see I'm like CLI dependent because it's not like I don't know how to do these things, but like anytime I can save keystrokes, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. And so it's really nice to have um, scaffolding tools. And um, I don't think a lot of people are like aware if they're not in the Angular community of how powerful the scaffolding tools are. Um, so for instance, if you, and we'll, we'll do this when we start to walk through our code, but you generate a new app. And one of the things is um, as you're building, okay, let's say I have this new feature, I can go ahead and automatically run a command to create a module and then start to create components, which are like building blocks in, in that. Um, and we have commands to do all these and those commands are going to scaffold like our, our base component class file. So a TypeScript file, um, an HTML file that's going to contain our, our template where we're going to put our markup. Um, it's going to uh, uh, create a test file, like a spec file for us to test our component um, and then a style file. And with the CLI, we can specify, do we want to use SAS? Do we want to use less? Do we want to use, you know, basic CSS mm -hmm. um, if you're a pleb? Um, <laughs> You know, <laughs> sorry, I'm in the consulting world, right? So like you would not believe some of the dumpster fire code bases I see where you're just like, and like no shade, but I can tell pretty much within 30 seconds if a code base was written by a backend 
developer or a front end developer. <laughs> <laughs> like, and again, no shade because like we have different skill sets um, and like, you know what you know, but it, it's kind of funny. Um, so you can do all this generation, you can spin up these files, but then the great thing is um, uh, the Angular uses what are called schematics. And so you can write your own schematics. There are some built in that are doing the scaffolding for you. Mm -hmm. But if you find your team um, creating components in a similar manner or creating uh, modules in a similar manner, you can actually write your own schematics to generate a lot of this bootstrap code for you. Um, so a good example of that would be, um, uh, Angular is built on top of TypeScript and RxJS. Um, so RxJS is a reactive programming library if people aren't familiar with. Um, but there are a lot of common patterns that we end up using with Angular. So if we have a component, we might be uh, using an observable in there, and then we might mm -hmm. have to subscribe to that observable and then clean up that subscription. Uh, there are some common patterns we use to solve this, and we can actually write Angular schematics to write that code for us. And so anytime we create a new mod or create a new module or component that's going to be following this pattern, we know that we're using, we can scaffold that out and mm -hmm. run a command to generate this. Um, so there's a lot of really powerful like tooling and customization that is available there that I feel like people outside the Angular community don't even know. Well, and, there, there, and like one of the things that I have noticed about this is that it creates an incredible amount of consistency. Like when mm -hmm. you look at Angular code bases, it, you, you're not going to be surprised by the way things are organized in there. Unless you're a consultant and you see people doing goofy ass shit where you're like, there's a CLI, what? <laughs> like, sometimes I'll review code and I'll be working with my team and I'm like, this is honestly so bad and so incorrect. I can't even tell you what's going to happen because nobody does this. It's just so wrong. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, this is going to cause bugs. I can't tell you the level of bugs, but yeah. So anyway. Uh, <laughs> You, there there will be the bugs. Tools provided, there will be consistency. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, uh, so so maybe actually that's a good segue into uh, maybe we should hop over and, and actually start playing with this stuff. So yeah. let's move over into this screen here. And uh, first and foremost, remember that this show. Oh, no, this is the browser we want to be in. Uh, this this show, like every show, is being live captioned as we speak. We've got Amanda with us here today. Thank you so much, Amanda, for hanging out. Um, Amanda is with White Coat Captioning, so you can head over to the homepage here um, and you can follow along if you want to read along with us today. That is made possible through the generous support of our sponsors. We've got Netlify, Fauna, Auth0, and Hasura all kicking in to make the show more accessible to more people, which really does mean a lot to me. Um, and keep in mind, when you go to the homepage, you can click these, go check them out. Okay, um, also, while you're clicking things on the internet, make sure you click over to uh, to Jennifer's page and give her give her a little follow. Um, it is a, it's a good account to follow. Look at all the stuff that she's created. I, I was actually like thinking how, how smart it was to do this <laughs> because I feel like I'm trying to like, how much can I fit into 160 characters here? And then I just give up yeah. and, and like, post nonsense. <laughs> um, but yeah, so head over there and then uh, we're playing with Angular today. So this is this is what we're going to be doing. OK, so links, all those things are out of the way. If I want to get started, I made an empty folder on my computer called Angular Forms, and I am I am very ready to uh, to learn things today. Cool. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that you've already installed the Angular CLI. Yes. Uh, cool. So I have the latest version. And let's also look at um, the Angular CLI. Here is a link to that if you want to see how to install it. I just used um, the NPM command. So I just installed mm -hmm. that. And we are using version 11.2.9, which I just installed it today. So I'm assuming that's the latest. Yes. Um, and since I'm, uh, there are a lot of people I think I've seen in the chat that are new to the Angular ecosystem, I want to kind of like call out a couple of things just to let you know a little bit more about how things process. Um, the team behind Angular at Google does try and release a new version every six months. Uh, for a long time, this was a very co common pattern. That being said, um, at one point they set out to uh, rewrite their compiler. Um, and so now modern Angular versions, I think it dropped in Angular 9, um, are using the Inc, the Ivy compiler. Um, this did a couple different things for us. Um, it reduced bundle sizes, it gave us faster compilation, but it also allowed us to actually um, do TypeScript checking in our templates. Mm. Um, so we have something that's called strict mode, um, where you um, 
this is what is preferred where you opt into a couple different um, flags that are going to be doing certain checks for maintaining the integrity of your code base. But okay. it is really, really nice to have that template type checking uh, available. So if you're you know, dealing with really complex objects or something like that, you're gonna get that notification of, hey, you're calling a prop here that, that may not actually, actually exist. So kind of cool to know there. Um, that being said, uh, Angular 12 is on the horizon. So if your team is kind of looking at versioning or exploring, or if you're like, oh, well, Angular updates too often and blah, 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 um, know that it's, they go for every six months. 12 is on the horizon um, and they're really conscious about breaking changes. So I don't think we have had really anything that was a serious breaking change since Angular 6. Um, so just because these new versions are rolling out consistently doesn't mean you're going to be reworking your project every time. So so then that means, so Angular is not following like Semver, they're, they're just kind of following like a major release every six months? That's the goal. And of course, you okay. know, there's a little bit of ebb and flow, but they're trying to balance, you know, um, optimizations and long-term performance against um, desires of the community. Some of those that we'll get into when we talk about forms and what we'd okay. like to see from forms. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the the loose goal that they try and follow. Okay, cool. All right. Yep. I, I, uh, that's, I, I guess I, like, I remember that. Um, and, and what you said earlier about Angular being like really, a really natural pairing for .NET. Um, mm -hmm. it, that that also points to something that that maybe you can confirm, which is that my suspicion is that Angular has been really popular for like larger businesses and like more enterprisey teams, and Agreed. and that's why a lot of us who are like extremely online and like startup culture might think that Angular is not that popular. It's wildly popular. <laughs> it's just not in the extremely online channels. <laughs> Well, and I think there are a couple of nuances there too, because you you talk to people who are, you know, of our background, right? Where we've been in the front end, we've, you know, been through every, you know, burn it up um, or, you know, build it up, burn it down again, iteration of a single page application framework. We, we are so deeply vested in the front end and solving those problems that we know what those problems are. Um, and so there's a lot of power that you have from that when you jump into a framework like React, you jump into a framework like Vue where you know the problems that you're constantly solving and running into um, and you know what you're doing. That being said, for a lot of enterprise um, companies, especially that have you know, had much more of a backend focus historically. Angular is often a much safer choice because it's very opinionated. There are these guardrails, but sometimes those teams need those guardrails because they're not experienced front end developers. Um, and, you know, we, we joke a lot on my team about when we're on client projects, we try and do things the right way, but we also want to be aware of what we call foot guns. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're very cautious about the code we implement um, and things that clients will accidentally shoot themselves with the foot with, in the foot with. If somebody doesn't have time, they're jumping around the code base copy pasting you, um that i mean that though i think is such an important thing to to consider because i i feel like as i've gotten more experienced um when i was younger i was very much like well we should just build it ourselves it'll be faster and i because i always <laughs> thought you know i well it's just me i can build it mm -hmm. like this i don't need to learn all these other conventions etc etc and when it was just me that was okay like i still mm -hmm. felt the pain of maintenance later on um, yeah. because the, the, as the old saying goes, if you're not using a framework, you're building a framework. Um, but then as I started working with more and more people, as I started working, as you said, with like people who were coming from, they were Java devs who just got put onto a front end team and they're like, that's your job now. Um, yeah. and they didn't really want to become front end devs. They just got moved. And mm -hmm. then you start to realize like the conventions, the the guardrails, the the setting up like automatic defaults that get you 90% of the way there, there's yeah. so much value in that. And so even if for me, it feels a little inconvenient to, you know, like, well, why am I creating three files for, for one component when I could just create one? Well, the convention, the, 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 you know, that, that system that makes it really predictable and, and very like, Hey, this is the box fit in the box. You don't have to think about the box. Just use it. Um, that is, it means so much when you're looking at like long-term sustainability of a system and, and, you mm -hmm. know, can you move somebody off this team without the whole system imploding? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like, not that, you know, any solution is foolproof, but these are the patterns I see and, you know, why I think Angular is as widely adopted as, as it is at that that corporate level. Um, you know, that, that maintain, maintainability is huge. And yeah, if anybody's ever had to write their own docs, like, you know what it's like. And so imagine if you're doing something custom versus something already existing. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. I see we got some, some Kansas City love in the chat. What's up, Will? 
How you yeah, doing? Yeah, I got Will here. Woo. <laughs> And yes, Chris, I was talking specifically to you about being extremely online. <laughs> um, okay, so so we've got uh, we've got ourselves the Angular CLI. We've got yep. an empty folder, um, yep. and I'm I'm ready. So if I want to get ready. started, we're going to build a new app. Okay, let's do it. Um, yep, yep. So the command for that is ng new. And if I want to use this folder and not create a new one, will it will it do that? Um, I can't remember if there's a flag to do that or not. Cause like, uh, when you, I just, I don't think about it cause I know how it works. Um, so it's going to generate a folder based on whatever name you give it. Okay. Let me do this then. I'm going to yeah, delete so go my folder level. Yeah. and then I'm going to just try that again. So let's go ng new. And then do I put the name in first or do I just run the command and then it'll ask me, uh, ng new space and then whatever, um, you want your application in to be. Okay. So this is going to do a couple the, 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 the CLI, the schematics that this is running are going to do a couple different things. They're going to ask you some questions. Um, all right. So do you want to enforce stricter type checking and stricter bundle budgets in the workspace? We are going to say yes, because we yes. like our code quality control. Um, Y'all would not believe one of the code bases we're auditing right now. They have not used TypeScript at all. And it's like buying a truck with four wheel drive and then only using two wheel drive like to go through fields or something. It's just absurd. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and say yes to adding Angular routing, just because um, I don't know if we'll use it in this application, but I want to make people aware that one of the things that I really enjoy about modern Angular is they do have a router built in. Mm -hmm. um, this was not the case in Angular JS, and so you'd have to hunt around and like do different routers or find something that works. And this is such a comp like single page applications. We need a routing strategy, and so I really like that this is built in with Angular, and I know yeah. it's not necessarily in in React or anything like that. Um, you can choose whatever um, styling language is your preference. I assume we're not going to do too much, so I'm just going to get regular CSS, like a pleb. Like a pleb, <laughs> like a pleb that I want to throw a punch. Um, <laughs> it's so funny. Like it, anytime I ever see like CSS as the default choice of like a client code base, I'm like, oh, okay, okay, we're dealing with some background yeah. engineers here. <laughs> Don't know how to write styles. Um, <laughs> I love my plain CSS. Uh, well, and it's just like if you're using um, a lot of built in like third party component libraries, I think Angular Material is built in SAS. So I tend to oh, like align. Okay. Yeah. And so sometimes it can be easier because if you're going to be doing any um, custom formatting or overriding or anything like that, sometimes it can um, make sense to stay in parallel. Because uh, gotcha. a lot of times we are seeing really heavy consumption of UI libraries, right? Um, where. Companies just don't have time to build their own UI libraries, have all the considerations. Maybe they don't even have a design staff to like think about building a coherent design system. Um, so I, I think that consumption is really, really heavy in the Angular community. Gotcha. Right. Um, yep. So I see that you have opened your app. And let's kind of um, just give everybody a little overview Hello? of um, what exactly has been generated for us if VS Code decides to get it shipped together. Yeah, what is it doing over here? Perfect. Do I need to? Oh no, beach ball. Oh no! Do I have something running? What is what is happening right now? Okay, maybe let's just try that again. Let's uh, let's let's just close code. Okay, bye. <laughs> Yikes! All right. I did. Uh, I was trying to stream a little bit um, last year before some work stuff got crazy, and I had an older laptop forever. But like, I could not stream. Like, I couldn't even share code in like Google Hangouts or do OBS or anything. Like, trying to edit VS Code. And finally, I was like, table flip. I'm getting a new computer. This is absurd. <laughs> yeah, I, okay. I actually switched to two computers. I think I had a runaway process there because when I when I quit it, it just fired right back up. Merp. Okay. All right, so let's look a little bit at what's going on. Um, you, We have our source directory, which is obviously where our source code is going to be written, but there are a couple other things I just want to point out for people who are new to the Angular ecosystem. Um, number one is this angular.json file. Um, and this is where a lot of kind of our, our options for our different schematics and things are available. Um, so any preset modes you've, you've picked, like for instance, um, you see strict mode, we opted in as true is going to be there. Uh, if you had picked like less or SAS or something like that, that would be indicated in this file. And so this is what schematics um, that you generate are going to look at to get mm -hmm. information about how to compile your code. Um, so we've got a couple different things here under architect. We have um, our build prop that's going to contain some options about how we're going to build our code. Um, 
uh, we've got any additional styles that we might be bringing in. Um, if you are having to bring in some specific um, scripts from a, a node library in a, a certain oh. way, that's available there. So, so my global styles, I, I put them here. Mm -hmm. Got yeah. it. Okay. Yep. Um, and this is just a thing I like to call out because, uh, you know, if you, even if you are an Angular developer, let's say you've gotten jump, dumped on a project that's already existing, you may never have touched this file in your life and don't even know what it's doing. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, yep, we've got that. Um, a couple different um, production um, issues here. One of the things I really like that Angular rolls with is they create this um, environments folder for you and automatically bootstrap, um, you know, the environment.ts and the environment.prod.ts. Um, and so it's already built in. So let's say you have like, you know, a test API that you're going to be hitting against versus a production API nice. that's already wired up and ready for you to go to, to pull from this environments file. So cool. again, like in front end development and building single page applications we're solving the same damn problems over and over and over again. And so Angular has dealt with a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, yeah, uh, a couple other quick things because I know another complaint, if you scroll back up real quick, sorry, oh, yeah. um, there was a budgets uh, prop here. Um, and so this is um, setting some default sizes for us for our component styles. And so we're going to get warnings and errors oh. if our components exceed a certain size. Yep. Um, and so these are really, really helpful because a lot of times, you know, you might be writing code and you not might not be thinking about the performance implications that's going to have. Um, and again, with some of the client projects I see and like thousands of lines of like highly imperative code, like that shit can sneak up on you and you don't yeah. even realize it. Well, th this, uh, so is, this is clever. Like this feels like the sort of thing that looking at this, I'm like, oh, of course, like, why wouldn't we do this? But yeah, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. And like, personally, I love this because a lot of times when I'm in client projects, like they're hiring us because they need us to fix their shit. Right. Um, and we're coming in, you know, probably is a more competent, you know, developer team and want to get best practices in place. And so we can use, you know, uh, gatekeeping techniques like this to like throw warnings on the code base and use those to kind of like safeguard when you have different team members crashing into the code base that have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of great options like that. Um, and then we've got a serve command down here. The cool thing is like, we don't have to do anything um, in particular to serve and live reload our app. That's all built in. Um, you can uh, do additional modification. Um, the CLI is uh, being consumed by Webpack. Um, so Webpack okay. is the tool being used under the hood to compile assets, to do bundling, yada, yada, yada. Um, so it's good to know if you did AngularJS back in the day, I remember I like implemented Webpack into AngularJS to get like testing up and running. And dear God, I was crying myself to sleep for like a week. It was a disaster. And this shit just like works, like chef's kiss every time. <laughs> Um, so like just kind of calling out that like black box magic is, um, Webpack is going to use these base level configs to use its magic. And then you can do all sorts of additional like integrations. If you need to use custom plugins for any sort of thing, um, that is all there. Um, nice. we've got some stuff for internationalization. Um, we've got, uh, you know, servers for, um, doing our testing. Um, this is at a unit testing level. Um, so all sorts of cool stuff going on in there. Yep. Um, Linters, these are also end to end tests. Yep. Yeah. So these are going to be tied to our command. So just like we did that ng new to build an application, anytime we use an ng command to do like ng lint, it's going to be looking at this first oh, um, to okay. understand how it's going to get its linting rules. Yep. So something just uh, I, so something just clicked for me, which is that what what I put in this Angular JSON, this is the command that I can run. Mm -hmm. um, would uh, you like to share anonymous data usage? Sure, Google. You can have my data. And then it lints. Yep. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So these are, you know, providing that customization or that information for these different things to run. Nice. Okay. Yep. 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 Um, and it's just, again, one of those things that if you've never touched it before, you probably have no idea. And like whoever like researches this kind of thing. So I figure we'll, we'll drop some knowledge nugs while we're here. <laughs> so then that means I can just run ng serve and I'm going to, it's just, it's going to just work. So let's. Yeah. So why don't we serve. do that? Why don't we ng serve and see what um, the, the team has delivered us. Um, that's going to be ready and available in our browser. What PowerShell are you using? Are you using iTerm2? This is iTerm2. Yeah. Like a boss. <laughs> I got turned on to this uh, this starship.rs for these uh, like the indicate it shows you what node version you're using and like what branch you're on whether I like or not it's, it. uh, it's it makes me so happy. Question: Does it track uh, track what npm registry you're on? I 
think there there's an option for that, but I don't use custom NPM registry, so I I don't. But I I'm pretty sure that I saw Ooh. somebody uh, set that up. Okay, I'll have to do that because like no, you know I'm switching back there. client projects every so often, and sometimes that'll troll me where I'm like, why won't my NPM install work? Oh, you're on the wrong registry, idiot. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah, this it's a really nice one. There's Ooh. a there's a whole bunch of cool stuff. It's also very fast. It's like you know it's a Rust Rust okay, deal. Um, and then if you want to see to anybody who's interested, I have a um, I have all this stuff. Where's my here's my dot files. In my dot files, you can see my my Starship Tommel is there. Nice. So if you want to just copy paste the way that I do my my config, that's that's where it lives, y'all. Um, this is why doing this format is like so much fun because you get to see like the cool stuff <laughs> like tooling that other people use that like you never allocate time to during your normal day. For real, um, I like I pick up stuff like this all the time. Like somebody will be on and they'll be like, "Yeah, just run this command," and I'm like, "What is that command? How have I never known about that?" Uh, do you remember when the synth code or synthwave eighty four theme for VS Code <laughs> dropped? Yeah. So that and dropped like. like Right before I was giving a, a talk at NGConf, and I was like, I like I put it in my last slide of that conference talk because I was like, I know people are going to ask what this theme is. It was like, oh, epic. My favorite part of that theme was uh, watching all of the internet try to figure out how to get the glow to work because <laughs> oh, like God. nobody could get it to work. Um, yep. It was amazing. <laughs> and then the second you had it working and you're co-chairing with somebody, they're like, ew, why is it glowing? How can you read that? <laughs> Bitch, get off my vibe. <laughs> Oh shit! Okay. Okay. Man, we are so like we super have off track. All right. So now we're all serve? good. This is it. Yep. I mean, in the context of this show, we are we are ahead of schedule. I think. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. So we can go ahead and boot up localhost forty two hundred, and this is our Angular application that is nice and served for us. Look at that! It's beautiful. So, so then sexy. this is going to come from a uh, app, I assume, and then if. Yep, so let's go code splunking. Um, so here's our basic structure. Um, we have our app.module.ts. This is our root application module. So in Angular, you you organize your code into modules. And um, a lot of times we'll be using these just to encapsulate features, but it's a way that we can share code that we've written or um, code that is you know provided um, for us by the Angular framework and, and do, ooh, I like that you have like these different sizes in your, oh, I'm like so creeping on your editor and your setup right now. This is great. <laughs> um, okay, all right, back on track, Jennifer. All right, so this is our kind of like home base for everything going on. And so we've got a couple different um, things going on inside of this um, ng module. We've got our declarations, which are where we're going to list any of our components that are gonna be used by this module. Um, we've got our imports. This is where we are going to import any modules that are used by um, our, our components that are declared inside this module. Um, so we've got a couple basic ones here. We've got the browser module, which is um, provided by Angular. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, some really common ones that people are going to be using are HTTP client module. This is the module that um, has a service for us to make um, HTTP requests. Okay. Um, another really common one is going to be the uh, forms module, whichever forms module we decide to use to provide us with that functionality. Okay. And so these modules are going to be bundling all sorts of different codes. Um, and as we get more into Angular development, I'll talk about these different things. But um, for instance, if we're in a component, um, we might be using some what are called like logic or structural directives. Um, so if you've ever seen like ng if and then a statement mm -hmm. there, those are directives. And so those are directives that are provided by, I believe, the common module that we'll probably end up having to import. I, I have no, I never remember what lives where. And so I just wait until the um, compiler yells at me and then I go and import what I need. Um, oh, so the compiler will tell us what we need. Like, I don't have to just remember this. It'll it'll be like, you're missing thing you need. Install this. Yeah. So um, as an example, let's go into um, our app.component.html file. And so this is going to be our app component that was exported there. This is what a um, base app component is going to look like. We've got our HTML. That they've just de generated and dumped in a bunch of stuff here. I, like, I love things. that they like gave us a... Right? Look, at the, look at this. It's almost a haiku. Like... <laughs> Yeah. Wait, is it the content below is only a placeholder and can be replaced? It's a haiku. Is it? Nice. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> oh. Oh, I wonder great. if that was, I bet that was intentional. That is great. I love it. I love it. Comment, like insider comment stuff makes me so happy because this, this is, this is how devs do art. This is our mm -hmm. finger painting. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Um, that, so that reminds me, like a lot of times we'll do performance audits on the Angular website, but we, um, for our Batomi.com website, we're using a third party, um, you know, CRM and it's not built the best. And therefore our actual performance of our personal website is not great because it, we're coupled to this stupid CRM. And so I like went in on like our, our performance assessment pages. And so if any developer pops open the dev tools to be like, do they really know what they're doing? I have comments that say, please don't judge us for the performance of this page. This is why go take it up with our, our third party CRM <laughs> vendor anyway. Um, <laughs> Because you know we're petty and we will go and look at source code for shit like that. We're so petty. Um, <laughs> okay, I see uh, there was a link to the Synthwave, so I'm going to put this up here so that we remember nice. to uh, include yes. it in the show notes. Yes. Synthwave. Uh, this is Synthwave a, 84. Okay, I remembered it right. Look at this fun, like it's got the glow. It's beautiful. So um, it really is. Use, a, did you ever use the power up plugin? You know, I would, didn't, like, but as you typed, it would like be exploding. I, and yes, then... Sarah Drasner uses that one in her terminal. And so she would be giving very serious company wide presentations where she would open up her terminal and there's like explosions and a high score racking up. I'm just like, Sarah, she's like, it makes me smile. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. You, you got to take those little joys in life. Like, yeah. Um, oh, okay. Okay. So, so here then I can kind of, we can just kind of empty this out, right? Like we yes. can. Yeah. The only thing that you're going to care about that was generated here is going to be a tag called router outlet. It's going to be fairly close towards the bottom. Um, this is just, yeah, obviously giving you a lot of markup. Boop, 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 boop. And then we've got this router outlet. Someday. Oh, here, all the way at the there end. There we go. Okay, yeah. Um, and so this is what the Angular router is going to look at, and that's what it's going to use as a as a place to render content um, as we change wraps throughout the application. So, okay. So how yeah. about I do this? I'm going to. Uh, no, don't you... do that. Oh no, no. Okay. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, you got me. You got... I was like, no, no, I do. <laughs> Uh, Let's do uh, I, so I we'll make a sense of humor. <laughs> so we'll make a little one of these. We'll do a, an H1 and say hello, chat. Uh, yes. And then we'll take one of these and we and can. And then you'll. S oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I don't know. I'm just going to like text the line center or something. Okay. Um, and then we can take the H1 and do a. Um, Actually, we don't really need to do anything. I that, would do say we? go even crazier and instead of this div, take it out of there and put your app dot and put it in your app dot component dot CSS file, and then you're a true Angular developer. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So let's get that out of here, and then we can go into app dot component dot CSS. We'll drop this in, um, and then we can save that, and let's go see what Angular did with that. Did you want to style your H one? I mean. Let's make it pink. There we go. All right. What's what's a good what's a good pink? Hot pink? Sure. Ooh, there's no way that passes accessibility. <laughs> <laughs> let's make the let's let's make it stylish. Deep pink. Ooh, that's not bad. There we go. Look at that. That's Ooh. that's the move. Um mm -hmm. <laughs> It's like I'm back in those GeoCities days, baby. <laughs> do we want to like pour one out for the blink tag going away, by the way? I know. You know what we did do, though, is in the chat, you can use the marquee tag in uh, in the chat for for the show. I, did I do it? No. Okay, that's you, not you, how you, you know, use you the tag. No, you have to just like write HTML. <laughs> uh... Yeah, we, we found out a while ago that I had forgotten to do HTML escaping. Um, for my, <laughs> look at it go. Are we spelling it right? Is it working? Yeah, yeah, no, it's where it only shows up on the overlay. Oh, yeah. okay, I see it, I see it. So I forgot to do HTML escaping, and so people figured out that they could like rewrite CSS rules on my overlays live on stream, and it went oh, shit. very poorly, as you may imagine. <laughs> That's um, delightful. So then when I was I was writing my HTML stripping, I just left in marquee because that ended up being really fun. I love it. <laughs> Okay, so we, we have, uh, I mean, we've got like, this is this is not going to win any design awards, but I'm kind of okay with that. If I yep. if I go to my styles.css, I can even do like a body 
margin zero, and then we can uh, actually, why don't we put the, the font stuff in here? And then we can do a background of black. Because dark mode makes us a 10x developer, right? Exactly. I, I, you know, I appreciate that you saw where I was going with this. <laughs> okay. So now we have our, our dark mode Angular app. Um, I, I love that the chat is just all about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, wow, that the nested marquee is pretty wild. It's good. I'm into it. Um, OK, let's uh, so so now next, I think what we want to do is let's get ourselves a uh, something. Do you, you want to set up a okay. form? Do you want to do a? Yeah. OK. So so let's set up a form um, and I want to challenge the chat to give us a use case. Like we're creating a form. What kind of information are we going to collect with the user um, while you and I talk through what we need to do to start creating a form? Yes. Um, so let's kind of do this in reverse and I'll, I'll talk about some of this like error stuff that you were seeing. So let's go into your um, VS code and let's oh, pull I, up that app. Should I leave the server running while I do this? Oh yeah, leave the server running. Okay. That's what I do. Um, and a lot of times I'll like my flow is I'll have it running in VS code because like spanning a bunch of different client projects, I'm just like swiping through windows all the time. And one <laughs> of the really cool things that dropped in Angular 11 is if you have multiple Angular applications and you go to serve up a new one, it will actually alert you and say, hey, you're already uh, running an app at 4200. Can we set you up at a different port? And I'm like, mm. you know what, Angular? Yes. I would you like to sure run, can. A, run at a different port. Thank you so much for <laughs> comping for my ineptitude of having way too many projects running at a given time. Um, okay, anyway, um, so let's go back in here and let's go ahead and let's create a form. Um, and so we are going to create a semantic form. And so we're going to start using our form tag. Okay, so we've got a form, and then am I setting it up like one of these, uh, or? No, just just do a, yeah, nothing like that. We'll just do it, and we'll kind of um, build got it. Got it, okay. Um, okay, cool. Uh, and then our form is going to need an input, um, so let's go ahead and create an input tag. Okay. What is the chat coming up with? I see a, a job application form. Okay. Um, that looks like the okay. only, everybody else is just doing marquees, so I <laughs> Thank you for the one person staying on track right now to help us. <laughs> oh, gosh. OK. Um, all right, so we'll have an input. And if we're doing a job CV, uh, we're probably going to have a name for our, or a field for a first name. OK, so we'll call um, this we one. We can do type it equals text. Um, and let's not use our name tag yet. Oh, not use the name tag yet. Well, OK, we'll, we'll talk about this in two different ways. but. Um, uh, yeah, we'll just leave it like that for now. Um, so in typical, you know, if you're just creating a form on the web, you are going to use a name tag. Um, and what that is going to do is like when you're getting the value of your for form, that's going to create that key with the value of whatever is entered in that input. So just like, so we're talking about things under the hood, because I feel like one of the problems we have, especially for newer developers, is they are coming into like framework land, right? And sometimes that keeps you from thinking about the underlying core concepts that are just our basic, you know, HTML APIs and the way the internet was meant to work. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm adding, I'm adding the for and the, the ID for, so that we have ourselves an accessible semantic form. Fabulous. Okay. Um, so we have a couple different ways that we're going to create some sort of binding, um, because at the end of the day, when we are building a form, it's typically because we want to capture information from the user and do something with the, with that information, typically submitting it to an API. Okay. Okay. Um, and I like to call this out because sometimes people start with the UI in mind. Like they know they have to implement X, Y, and Z features and they forget that at the end of the day, you are just trying to get information from the user that you're going to translate to the back end. So when I see people developing forms in Angular, the number one thing I tell them is don't start with the UI, start thinking about the data that you need to submit to the back end and then work from there. Mm -hmm. Because they'll get really like, you know, just UI happy and hooking everything up and then be doing all this like weird, like where they're having to pull out certain values and trying to like map and glob together, like whatever value they actually want to submit. And okay. it just leads to like more imperative, like hard to maintain code. Okay. All right. I thought I muted notifications on my Mac, but I'm like getting calendar advice nonstop. Calm yo titties, people. Um, <laughs> story of my life. Okay. Uh, so... <laughs> 
back to our angular forms. Um, I'm going to this, aren't I? Okay. Um, with Angular, we have two different form modules that we can use. Um, okay. One is called the template-driven forms approach, and the other is the reactive forms approach. Okay. So if you ever did coding in AngularJS, um, template-driven forms feels really familiar where we have this ng model directive that we apply and we use that to get the, the value that the user has entered and tie it and do something with it programmatically. Um, I spend, I tend to do a lot more things in reactive form simply because that's what I'm more comfortable with. Both approaches are completely fine. Both actually implement things um, the same way, like under the hood. Like if you actually look at, at the code and the way things function, they are like built on the same pieces of, of what Angular provides. Um, so just just know that there are two approaches aware there. Template driven forms is going to use ng model. Um, reactive forms are going to use different directives, and typically the the equivalent to an ng model is going to be called um, form control. Okay. So, um, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to create a link between our element in the DOM to the the you know let's just say variable that we want to access and be able to do things with and manipulate in our component. Okay. Um, so the first thing we're going to do here is on our input, uh, oh, we are input. going to, uh, yeah, on our input. And, and I'm going to kind of like work this work backwards and kind of show you like some things that Angular will do. Um, inside of brackets, uh, I'm going to have you type form control. Uh, square boys or? Square boys. OK. Like this? Yep. Uh, sorry, um, camel case. So uppercase C, no dash. Yep. Okay. Okay. And then you're going to set that equal to um, first name or like, and we'll just, uh, no, sorry, after the brackets. What? Yes. Like, like equal, this? Yep. Uh, and then quotes? in quotes, first name. Yep. Got it. Okay. We're going to kind of work backwards and we're going to do things a little bit goofy because I'm going to show you some of like what Angular is going to yell at you about um, when you're kind of like, uh, understanding what exists in what module that you need to import and whatever. Yeah. Okay. All right. So save that and let's jump into our app.component.ts file. It's yelling. Okay. So I'm in my yeah. app. Doc. Don't look at it yet. Don't look at it yet. We're going to do a couple things first. App.component.ts. Yep. All right. Um, and we're going to declare a new member on this component. We're going to call it first name. Uh, so like... under title, sorry. Um, oh, nope. oh, oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, Sorry, on our class, on our app component class. Yep, first name, and we'll just send it to an empty string for now. Um, I don't really care what's going on because uh, okay. I'm gonna kind of show you what what it's gonna do. All right, so we have a, a variable. We have a member on our class that our template is going to be binding to. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so go ahead and save that, and now let's go and look at our errors. Okay. All right. Um, so this error is can't bind to form control since it isn't a known property of input. Um, so basically what's happening is we're using this form control directive, but we haven't imported it anywhere. And so our component doesn't like have a reference to form control to know what we're trying to do here. And so I feel like this is a really common error that if you're jumping to Angular for the first time, you're going to see something like this. And so what this means is if you're trying to use a directive or a piece of Angular that you know exists and is available, you have to import the correct module that's going to allow you to access that directive. Right. And OK. And so that part happens. Uh, wait, I remember it happens okay. here. Yeah. OK. Yep. Um, so what we're going to do in our imports array is we are going to import the reactive forms module. And so I think with your plugin, oh, bam, look at that. Look at it go. We got. Look at that. Look at that. Um, all right. So um, we have our reactive forms module now. Um, so we can save that. Um, and when this recompiles, we are maybe going to be happy again because um, they're OK. Yep. So now we have a different error. OK. Um, so what this form control directive is looking for is for us to create an instance of a form control. Um, and so okay. one of the things that I advise people to um, have pulled up in the docs all the time uh, whenever they're dealing with forms is a certain page on the Angular docs. So I'm going to have you go to angular.io. And then in that search bar, I'm going to have you search for abstract control camel cased. Here? Yep. All right. And click that first one. All right. Um, so anytime we are dealing with building um, forms, uh, the the base building block of a form like that we would tie to an input for value, for instance, is a form control. Um, but we end up heavily utilizing um, form group and form array to help nest and create 
data to reflect the way we would want to submit data to a backend. Um, so an example of this is, okay, let's say we're collecting a CV. We might have a first name key. We might have a last name key. Maybe we have an address key, which is a nested object. Mm -hmm. We can use form group and form control to create that structure. Okay. And the reason I have you pull up this abstract control class is because this is the base class that all of these different instances extend. So all of these properties, all of these methods are available when we're dealing form control, form group, and form array. And so I find like, I, this is a lot of stuff to memorize, right? And you will get this from your IntelliSense, but I tend to tell people to pull this up just to understand all the things that are available to you. Yeah. One of the number one things I see people doing wrong with implementing Euler forms is reinventing the wheel when they don't have to, simply mm -hmm. because they're not aware of what's available via the API. Got and it. documentation is hard, like no shade on the Angular team, but um, it's, it's hard to document like every little thing, right? Um, and so having a really good understanding of the, the base underlying API of how these things work, I think is really key to you being able to build forms better in Angular. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to go back to our code and we're going to create a, an instance of this form control um, to bind to our group. Oh, actually, sorry. I completely like spazzed out. Um, let me go. Let's go back to the docs real quick because I want to kind of okay. show you why. All right. So this this abstract control is like, let's let's just make it really, really basic if we think about like an object, right? It's going to have a value because at the end of the day, we care about having something in a way to get that value from the user. But when we're building forms, there are a lot of other things we care about. Uh, we care about whether that form element is disabled or enabled, right? Like sometimes we need to support different use cases. Um, so being able to know if it's enabled or disabled, as well as being able to trigger um, enabled or disabled functionality is key. Um, a lot of times we'll be dealing with validation where we want to, um, you know, have certain ruling to say, okay, based on X, Y, and Z, this input or this value given by the user is valid or invalid. So we want access to that. We want ways to set validation rules. Um, so a form control is going to manage the value that the mm -hmm. user is given. So we're creating that binding, but it's also going to be managing its own state. Okay. Um, and so that has to do with whether it's valid or it's valid. And then I see in the chat, somebody's asking about dirty and pristine. Yeah. Um, so these are different ways that we can track um, exactly what level a control has been interacted with. So an example would be, let's say we want to outline um, our, like some piece of our UI in red if, uh, if an input is wrong. Okay, fairly common use case. Well, it's really, really frustrating from a user experience standpoint if like everything is technically invalid uh, when you like first log in to look at a form, right? Because no, mm. no information is there when needed. And it's really, really irritating when everything is just in red and you're like, okay, shitty bank website. Like I haven't entered anything yet. I know it's invalid. But if you want to only show that invalid status after like, let's say you've clicked into something, right? Like, and you have a blur event. So you clicked into a field, you don't enter it, you move away. Then it's an appropriate time to let a user know, hey, just FYI, this field is invalid. Um, so by having these different like interaction states of how a user is interacted with a form control, we can create a better user experience with how we're reflecting validation. And, and so to, to repeat this back, pristine yep. is before any interaction has happened. Like it's, it's yes. rendered on the page, nobody's clicked on it, typed in it or anything. And then yep. dirty is any interaction, including a focus event. Yes. So like a good example of dirty would like be like, okay, somebody's typed something in it, or maybe they've typed something in it and then they've backspaced it because those are two for two different scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if there's content, it might be valid, but if they've backed it out, it's invalid, but not necessarily never been interacted with. Um, so you got the ones like that touched, untouched. Um, and so these are just kind of um, properties, like a way of tracking state on this form control that allow us to hook in and create, you know, a much better user experience. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, we'll probably flip back and forth to this documentation, but I wanted to give people like kind of a base level understanding of when I'm saying we're going to create a new instance of a form control, why that is and what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody's asking, is it dirty when you started typing but haven't blurred the field? I honestly don't remember like what the exact rule for dirty is. Um, I feel I like this know. is the sort of thing where we would just need to start logging everything and, and just check. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think you might be able to get it from like the IntelliSense or if you click down into there, they might have the ruling, but I honestly just don't remember. Um, I tend to, you know, do a lot of stuff on touch. Um, 
Okay, so let's go ahead and get this started. Um, so we have our first name and what we actually wanna do is we wanna set this to an instance of form control. So instead of that empty string, um, we're going to back up um, so you can get rid of that. And then we're going to um, uh, set first name equal to new um, and then form control. Yep, and that should and it auto, auto completes. Yep, and so that'll automatically import it from our Angular Forms module, which we imported. Um, and then uh, this is going to take the form state as the first parameter. Um, okay. There are a couple different ways you can do this. It, uh, Angular will accept shorthand, but for best practice, I tell people to do it this way, okay. um, where we're going to create an object, uh, we're going to pass in value with whatever initial value we have. Um, so we could do an empty string, we could do null. This really depends on your use case and your validation and what you need. Um, because you know an empty string might uh, um, evaluate to truthy in situations that you're not expecting mm -hmm. it to. So just you know JavaScript. Hey. Um, all right. And then the next is uh, disabled. And so we're going to go ahead and we're just going to set disabled to um, false. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, so that's like our initialization. And then the second parameter that this would take um, would be validators and any custom options. But we're just gonna we're gonna keep things simple for now. And we don't need any of those for now. So we can just leave this as is. Yep. Okay. All right. So we save that. Hey, no hey, more look explosions. At that. We compiled successfully. Yeah. All right. Um, so like obviously I could have just told you like, hey, import forms module first, da, 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 da. But if you were again new, crashing into Angular, like crashing into Angular code base and you're seeing these errors, I want to walk you through what that's gonna look like so people can kind of grok, oh, okay, mm -hmm. this is what this means. I need to figure out what module that this thing that I'm using is imported from and then go import that wherever I need it. Yeah. Um, yep. And so looking at this, um these are just linked. Like when I when I type in this, it's uh, like we now have access to this value. We don't have to. That's that's pretty slick. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Um, yeah. So let's 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 build a, a silly little use case. Um, let's go ahead and let's add a new member on our component called last name. Okay. Um, so just similar to oh, the way new, we did. Oh, a new new member. Yep. Sorry, I was getting ahead yeah. of you. Oh no, you're fine. Um. Yep, and so let's change this to last name. It's going to be the exact same thing there. Okay. All right. Um, so save that. Let's go in our app component, um, and let's go ahead and you know add that new yep copy pasta um, for our last name. Last name. What am I doing? I don't know. What are you? I don't doing? know why I made that so hard. I could have just typed it capital L. Oh, you're fine. Okay, cool. Um, so here's our, our so little form, but let's uh, let's add some ruling around this. Um, let's say that we uh, don't even want our last name field to be enabled until a user's entered a first name because we feel like really like micromanaging the shit out of them with how they're dealing with our form. Okay. Um, so let's change disabled to true. All right. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to understand when that first name value changes to enable new ruling or or cause something to happen with our last name field, right? Mm -hmm. All right, um, so let's uh, go into our app component. And then what we're going to do is we are going to add a lifecycle hook. And this is pretty common for um, Angular development. Um, Angular is built on these different lifecycle hooks that are running at different times during the, co the component lifecycle. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do, because we are type safe, is where we are defining our app component class. We're going to say implements on init. So after, yep, there, implements on init. And I always get these backwards, yep, hit there. OK, um, so this is kind of cool. So if you're new to TypeScript, um, anytime we're saying we are going to be implementing something like an interface or something like that, that means if we do not satisfy the requirements of that interface, we're going to get a TypeScript warning. So anytime nice. we're implementing on init, it's expecting a method called ng on init to be implemented in our class. Okay, so some some cool ruling there. Um, so we we have these nice you know guards with TypeScript that are going to make sure that we're doing things the right way. So ng okay. on init is um, that, and that's a method. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and we'll just type this to return void because this method is not going to return anything. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I mean type the or type the return type of the function. Oh, I got so you. I got you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There you go. 
Okay, just because I want to teach everybody best practices while we go on our, our form adventure. All right, um, so a lot of times um, this, this uh, lifecycle hook is going to run when our component is initialized. So after the class has been created, but like the component has been initialized is when this is gonna run. So we end up putting a lot of our functional code where we're interacting like with something like this in our um, on init lifecycle hook. Um, and I'm seeing is the auto import thing happening a TS thing too, where it's automatically updating the import statements. It should be. I think so. I can never remember like what VS Code is doing and what my plugins are doing. So the so VS Code uses TypeScript under the hood to do auto importing. So it, it is TypeScript, but it's not like because we're writing a TypeScript library. Um, it'll work in, if you enable that setting, it'll work anywhere in VS Code. Um, it's more predictably good in TypeScript projects though, because it's like the project is TypeScript all the way down. Mm -hmm. It's delightful and it's really helpful. Like, you know, I, I say to have the documentation pulled up, but the really great thing about TypeScript is like, as you're importing these different modules and using these different pieces of, of the Angular API, you're going to get IntelliSense, um, mm -hmm. which make this really, really powerful. Um, so as an example, let's go back to our problem where we want to do something different. We want to enable the last name um, input when the first name input changes and has a value. Um, so what we can do Oh, I like your I like your code comments. <laughs> I also like to include the why. Um, why are we doing this? Because business has a stupid requirement. Um, like I feel like a lot of times people will be like, oh, well, I should document what the code is doing. Whereas I want to know why the code is doing something. If you've written something like a little bit squirrely, I want to know that there's a purpose behind it because it's to satisfy some bullshit requirement that isn't mm. detectable from the way you've written code. Yeah. So why? Because we're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, like when I'm reviewing pull requests for my team and they they do something weird, I'll be like, "Will you add the Y comment there?" And they're like, "Yep, no problem, I forgot." <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get access to our um, our our first name form control, so we can do this dot first name um, and get access to our component member. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, and then the cool thing is, this is what, you know, this IntelliSense is going to give us is if you do dot, it's going to list out all the properties and methods available to us because it knows that this is a type of form control. So, you know, don't, don't think I'm some magic wizard or anything like that. I'm just as dependent on IntelliSense as everybody else. I just have spent like way too much freaking time <laughs> like trolling through, <laughs> through Angular source code, um, to unlock secrets of Angular forms. So anyway. Uh, we are going to get into a little bit of RxJS magic here. Okay. Um, so uh, reactive forms are built on top of RxJS. And so that means um, there is going to be an observable that emits um, when the value changes on our form control. Um, so there is a value changes method that we're going to use. I saw it a second ago. Value changes. Yes. All right. Cool. Um, and so if, uh, uh, you look at this, sorry, I shouldn't have said method. That's not the proper terminology. Um, you can get rid of those parentheses and hover over that because I think it should give you the type of observable that it's going to admit. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to admit an observable of any, um, so observables are streams of data over time. Um, and so, uh, RxJS is a beast and have you done any RxJS talks on learn with Jason? Uh, no, we have used observables in a couple projects, but we've never actually like learned observables. Oh, I might have to hook you up with some resourcing there. That, that would, be, would be of interest. I think it definitely would be. I think, uh, cause I don't get them. And I think yeah, that it, it's something that would be very useful to a lot of folks, including me. Yeah. Um, like if you, if you've heard of all about like more declarative programming or reactive programming, it's a style that we've started to adopt. Um, definitely, definitely heavily in the angular side. Mm -hmm. Um, but reactive pro or RxJS makes it really great to deal with reactive programming or do more reactive programming because we are, you know, dealing with streams, whether it's, um, a response from an API, whether it's interaction with a user and we can combine these things in a very stream like 
way to write just very, very declarative code. Um, and so the idea here is probably everybody is used to writing imperative code, which is where you are constantly manually changing the state of your code. So let's say, you know, your, your state, you have a loading member on your component. Um, an imperative approach was going to, you'd like, you know, have a function that executes and you're going to say, okay, this dot loading and set it to true. And then something else happens and you say this dot loading and you set it to false. Mm -hmm. um, a declarative approach is going to be where you declare what loading state will be based on these various things that can happen. Mm -hmm. And then layer on top of that with, hey, be love. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the layer on top of that would be reactive programming where we are bringing together streams. So like, let's say form um, values changing over time as the user interacts with it um, and using that as a part of our declaration to say what's going to determine the value of um, loading. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I can um, I can see the value in that. I, I definitely think that would be a good follow-up episode to, okay. to dig into this. When my schedule calms down, let's, let's schedule a um, reactive programming session. Absolutely. Okay? All right, sweet. Um, I'm just going to be like that bossy bitch who's like, I think you people need to know about this. Um, <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, so value changes is going to emit an observable. Um, the type is any here, but it's going to be whatever a um, user inputs or enters in our input. And so if you're used to thinking about this, um, dealing with inputs on an on change event, every time a change occurs, mm -hmm. um, that's when this observable is going to emit. Oh, man. All... Oh, Mike okay, just showed up. Kids are dropping in. We, we've got Mike Harrington on deck. Um, all right. Uh, so what we are going to do is um, we are going to uh, subscribe to this observable. Um, so when we create the subscription, we will start getting any values that are emitted by this observable, this, this value changes observable. All right. So inside of there, um, we can go ahead and um, do another parentheses and we'll just call this, you know, first name value. All right, and Whoops. then um, just this to give button. people, yeah, a visual representation, let's just log out to the console what first name value is, or if you want to like print it somewhere or whatever you want to do um, that jives with your workflow. I'm a very visual person, um, so I'm probably more console log dependent than I ever should be, I'm, but it just helps me map things better. I'm all the way with you there. That is that is how I, look at it go. Hey, hey, hot damn, hot damn, hot damn. Oh my God. Hey, what's up, Kevin Powell? <laughs> Thank you for the raid. Uh, one of my team members dabs all the time and it's like become one of those little things that brings me joy. <laughs> also, one of my other team members like created a Jennifer rage emoji, which is like my headshot with just like my head and it like shakes. Anyway, <laughs> quality culture. Okay. All right. So we've done something really awesome here. Now we have access to whenever our value changes and we've said, hey, if first name has a value, we then want to enable our last name control and allow a user to interact with that. Yeah. So, let's so go ahead and let's, ooh, okay. So I can I can work out part of this. So if I if I do okay. like first name value, yep. uh, dot length is greater than zero. Mm -hmm. That's how far. That's where, that's where I've gotten. Cool. Okay. Um, so let's be super lazy and use our IntelliSense. We know we want to access our our last name form control, right? So we can do this dot last name. And then we want to enable our form control if our thing has a value. So, hey, look at that. Look at that. There's an enable method. I bet that's the one we want to use. Just like that? Yep. Ooh. Okay. Bam. All right. Let's see how All that right. works. Ta-da. <gasps> hey, wait. You didn't go away when I said. Oh, because I didn't disable. Yes. So here's part of the problem that we don't love a lot about reactive forms is in Angular, reactive forms are built on RxJS. So they have observables. They are not necessarily reactive. They are still highly imperative in the way that we have to interact with them. Um, I hope that like actual like forms are on the horizon for reactivity, um, but they are reacting reactive forms in name and not in true philosophical reactivity. Mm, they're yeah. They're, they're reactive charlatans. Yes, exactly. Um, so, you know, I, I bet you can figure out, yeah, what you need to do is go ahead and else do that disable and you're good to go there. Um, so kind of cool that we are able to hook into when value changes are, um, you know, firing off and be able to make different things happen. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of control and there's a lot of power we have in here just from, you know, like whatever kind of use cases we want to manipulate for our forms. 
Yeah, it's really, really handy. Um, cool. We can do something like this. Let's make it pretty. This is the hardest part of my talk is like, or my talks, like I, I want to create demo apps and I just don't have the like emotional or mental energy to make them pretty. Like, can I just hire you to like design my stupid demo projects? <laughs> A lot of them revolve around Animal Crossing. I, cause there's an Animal Crossing API somebody created. Ooh, nice. And so yeah, a lot of my projects are like interacting with that API. Um, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Forms are a bunch of inputs in a trench coat anyway. That's, that's true. Good. <laughs> Yes, correct. Not wrong. Not wrong. Cool. Okay, so now we have we have a form. Our mm -hmm. form has some some intelligence where we can say if I if I type here, I can put the last name in. If I then delete this, I can no longer interact with this until I put mm -hmm. a value back in here. Yep. Good. That all makes sense. Sweet. Um, what? Uh, so I, I feel like there's a little more we can do here around like submission or yes. different types was, of inputs i was just about to say let's start with submitting and then okay. let's kind of like work backwards from where we are now to figure out better workflows for implementing forms all right um <laughs> nice uh, just before this talk i yeeted one of my cats in my bedroom because he had been like harassing my other cats um so let's kind of do things on the angular way um, because sometimes what you would do is you would bind a uh, a button click to your form um, and then do a submission that way. But we're going to just use a basic click event for our button and, and wire things up that way for now. Although I'll give you a second if you're updating your styling real quick. Yeah, I'm just going to do a, a, let's do like a max width of, we'll say 500 pixels, um, make it make it responsive, why not? Um, and then here we can go with a margin of, uh, just center that up and that should make this work. Not quite. Maybe we'll just make this a lot smaller. You know, you try to make something, you try to do something nice and then you're in a CSS hole. Uh, we want to go left now. And let's make our inputs and buttons. 100% wide. Hey, close enough. Kind of. Not quite. It's fine. We're going to leave that. That's good enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I know man. I know what I need to fix, but that's not what we're here to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, and this is how we go down rabbit holes. Um for somebody who just turned in, uh right now we are talking about reactive forms. Oh, Cassidy has arrived. We can tell because oh, I'm nearly buried. Oh, shit. <laughs> Hello, Cassidy. I oh, love it. All right. So let's talk about um, getting the values of our form. Um, okay. So right now, if we were to submit information about our user for their resume to a back end, we would want to get the, the first name and the last name. Um, so if we go to our component, right, or sorry, let's wire up our function. Um, so yeah, yeah go back to your Because right now when I do it, like nothing happens. Yeah, exactly. Boop. All right, so okay. let's just wire this up a little bit. Um, so on our button, let's do a click event. Um, so the way you do that in Angular Land is inside of parentheses. Um, do click. And then we're going to set that equal Whoa. to my func or my submission function. Just like in print in print or in quotation marks. Sorry, I can't talk. Like yeah, that. And then parentheses. Oh, like we just uh, dropped because it right we're now. executing a function. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, there you go. Like you're calling. Okay. And why aren't we getting yelled at? Um, save that because the linter should be yelling at us for trying to call a function that doesn't exist in our component. Because yeah, we love TypeScript. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. I love errors. <laughs> Oh, come on, you know we've all been there when you're like not getting errors and you're like, what is yes. wrong with my life? <laughs> um, cool. All right, so let's go into our component and let's wire up this function. Okay, um, so, so I need a function. I can just name this whatever I want, right? Or yeah. not name it whatever well, no, I want, but I need to name it. My submission function. Yep. All right, let's go ahead and type that to return void because we're just going to console log out a form value right now. 
All right. So I, I guess a pop quiz time, Jason, if you were going to attempt to get the value of our form um, inputs right now, how would you do that? I would do it like this. Okay. That okay. seems right. Let's find so, out. What you're actually gonna, oh, do you want me to wait? Oh. oh, objects, no. What you're actually logging out is the form control instance. Oh, so this dot okay. form name is a form control, or this dot first name is a form control, um, not the value of it. But I bet your IntelliSense would tell you that there is a dot value prop on there that will contain the current value of that form control. How do I uh, prevent the default submission? Like, do I get an event in here? Because um, it's it's yeah, refreshing can... the page when I hit uh, submit right now. Oh, oh, yeah, you could do an event dot prevent default. I totally forgot about that. Um, and do I need to pass that in in the? Um... Yes. So the way that you do that is um, the I think it's dollar sign event. God, this is stuff that like I just will not lock in my brain that I look up every time. Um, it's either like event dollar sign or dollar sign event. I don't remember. Uh, uh, doesn't like event implicitly has any type. Oh, all right. My Angular people in the chat. I'm forgetting dollar event. Oh, but all right. Um, Oh man, we might have what to. What if I just make it a regular it. any? Um, Will you leave me alone then? Might yell at you, but we'll see. Aha! I have right, defeated TypeScript. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> well placed. Well placed. Oh God, this is great. Um, I feel like there are like all these other like random little nugs that I want to drop. Um, but I'm trying to like somewhat keep myself on track while I watch the time. Okay, yeah. um, let's get to one thing real quick because you can imagine doing something like this would get like tedious in a quick hurry if we were having to just access every um, different key that we want some, doing something like this. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where some of our other um, uh, available directives come in handy. Um, so okay. what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new member on our class and we're gonna call it my form. I should probably put this above the function, huh? Uh, well, I kind of want to throat punch you for like doing shit in a weird order, but wow. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. All right. So we're going to do my form. And what we're going to do is we're going to set this equal to new form group. Um, so what this is going to do is it's going to create an object um, and it's going to expect whatever we pass into the object to be something, whether it's just a form control, whether it's another form group, whether it's a form array. Yep, okay. Yes, you got your auto import there. All right. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to do first name as our key. And then do I pass in like that? Uh, no, we're, I guess technically, yeah, you could do that. I mean, if it was like, if I was doing this, like from the get go, I would just go ahead and do new form control and not have them chunked out like that. Like, but your way works because it's still just a reference to that. But so we like, can, we can consolidate this then. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's consolidate. Um, yeah. And there's a step further that we can consolidate and I'm kind of worried it might be too much of a rabbit hole, but um, there is something built into Angular called form builder, which um, gives you shorthand to do all this, but let's do it this way for now, because this is a, a learning session and I want people to understand the basics of exactly what we're creating here. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. Uh, but some homework for y'all is to go figure out what form builder is and does. Yep. Okay, so we have um, first name, last name. Now, is this going to, so this obviously is not going to work anymore, but will no. it continue to work in the component? Okay, so no, it will, well, no, it will not continue to work in the component. So we have to kind of like redo things there, but I'm going to show you guys okay. a couple of cool things. All right, so what we want to do for this parent level form group is we want to bind it um, to a container where everything inside of that container is going to have access to it. So in this case, it makes sense to put it on our form. Okay. Um, so we can use the form group directive. So inside of your square brackets, you do form group. Yep. And then you can pass it the um, my form, or whatever we called it. Um, we called that my form. Yes. I yes. look at that IntelliSense. Hot damn, hot damn. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. Um, so now save it and you're going to get an error. 
And we'll kind of look at this because um, I want to kind of walk through people through the changes that we're making. Okay. Uh, property first name does not exist on app component. That's correct because we no longer have a member on our component first name. What we have right. is a member on our component, my form group, which is a nest of form controls. Okay. So there are two different ways that we can solve this. Okay. Um, one is we can get programmatic access from our more my form objects. So instead of um, first name, do my form. Uh, dot controls dot first name. Okay. okay. Um, so there's a controls prop on our our for, form group, and that's going to have a list of anything inside of our form group, whether it's a form control, whether it's a form array, whether it's whatever. Um, so this is a, a way to get programmatic access, but this is not super readable. And I think it's really, really intimidating um, to people newer to forms. So what's really cool is we have a different directive that we can use that um, is kind of a getter directive that we can pass a string to. Um, so instead of form control, um, get rid of our your brackets there and we're gonna call it form control name, camel case. All right, and then what this directive is going to accept is a string, and then what it's going to do is it's going to attempt to look at its parent object. So in this case, our my form, and find a string or find a key in it in it that is first name. Got so this it. is a yeah much more readable in my opinion way um, to deal with kind of these complex form scenarios because you can get situations where you're like my form dot controls dot this dot controls dot and it's just nasty mm -hmm. um, versus you can use the form control name directive that's just more readable, a little bit more friendly. All right. So, oh, wait. Um, okay, I'm getting ahead of us now. So, so we're not yes. getting errors around this anymore, but now we're getting right. errors around our uh, our change. Yes, and that is again because we're trying to um, subscribe to the value changes of a member of our component that no longer exists. And so, are um, we doing this one here, or? Yep, yeah. uh, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that way. Controls. Con um, control. Or we can do my form dot get and then pass in a string. So two different options. I don't have as much of a preference here. I feel like I like um, this a little bit. This feels a little more, I don't know, maybe not. Human readable. Yeah. Is this oh, right? Okay. Yeah. So this, um, this is a TypeScript thing. Um, so the deal here is TypeScript is not able to determine from the string what type this might be. It doesn't know if it's it just doesn't know what it's what it is. So a lot of times what I'll end up doing here is I'll create a um, variable inside of this function called first name control. Okay, and I'm gonna set that equal to this dot my form dot get first name. And I'm gonna tell TypeScript exactly what it is. So I'm gonna do as form control. So I'm telling TypeScript, hey, this is what this is. Okay, all right, so now if we replace that with first name control, TypeScript is able to say, oh, okay, I know this is a form control. I Got know it has it. a value change that's observable. Um, also more readable and a lot of times in situations like this, again, because reactive forms aren't truly reactive, we are having to do some like imperative coding drama and you'll be referencing the same form controls over and over and over again. So this is also just like a, a good pattern to get into um, is, you know, essentially a-listing your, your controls that you know you're going to be accessing over and over and over again. Okay. And so this then, we're back in business, I think. There we go. Hot damn, hot damn. Look at that. Um, Magic. But I don't have, so we, we don't have the, the value back, but we can submit. Right. So like, I want to go back to what I said about that abstract control class and mm -hmm. then everything extends that form control, form group, form array. And so the same way we're using that dot value on our form control, we can use the dot value on that form group. And what's it, mm. what it's going to return to us is that key value pair of whatever the key is and then whatever the value is of the provided form control or form group or form array. Okay, so if I do this dot my form dot value, yep, we'll just find out what that does. Yep, and then I'm gonna, you're gonna want to restructure your console log based on this. So we'll we'll see. Okay, so we've got a name and a, oh look at that, it gives me the name. Wait, mm -hmm. how did it do that? What do you mean? How did it? Do how did that? it get the? Wait, never mind. I'm a doofus. <laughs> I was like, I was like, it learned. It's learning. The computers are thinking. Uh, <laughs> no, we are. Okay, oh, so boy. so then I can do something like um, 
first name, last name equals this my form values. Nope. Mm -hmm. Value. Value. Yep. And then down here, we can get back to what we were doing before. Yes. That being said, typically, if you're dealing with forms, you're going to be wanting to submit, like, let's say, an object to an API. Mm -hmm. And so that's a mistake that I see people making is like they, they, again, start with the UI instead of understanding how to um, structure this using form group, form control, and form array to build that data structure that they want to ultimately submit to the back end. So that mm -hmm. way you can just call dot value in your parent level form group and not have to do all this like, you know, mapping and, and, and trying to like pull out this value and not use that value and that kind of thing. And so to, to kind of look at this in a, a more like what we would send to the, the database way, we could stringify yep. this dot my form dot value. And I'll just yep. make it a little easier to read by prettifying it a bit. Yep. And then let's, uh, so this then we could send this directly to the, to the back end. Mm -hmm. That's pretty yeah. handy. That's slick. Yeah. And like this again is a mistake that I people, I see people making is they get really hung up on the UI part of it when it's like, no, hang on, think about the, the data that you're trying to collect and convey and then work backwards from there. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is I mean, this is really, really nice. Like I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan of this approach. And I mean, we like we're, we've hit the end of what we're going to be able to do today. But there's a yes. ton of like it's you can see here how like the conventions are here. The 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 base building blocks are here. The fact that we ran one angular command and then everything else like kind of just worked as we included stuff and angular yelled at me whenever I didn't import something so that I knew what to include. Yeah. That's really, really handy. And you can, you can see the, like why this is a good way to go. Yeah. Um, real quick. I did see something in the chat that I would not recommend as a good thing to do. And so I want to call that out just to be informative. Um, somebody said, if TS is complaining about something could be undefined, you can assert that it's not via adding an exclamation mark at the end. Hmm. Technically that is correct. That being said, I do have a blog post on non knowledge coalescing and when you should and should not use it. Um, and this would be a use case where I would say, do not use non null coalescing to get around this. Um, I can't remember, I have it on dev2. I can send you the link if it, ugh. Where is uh, it? It's not Here? on my blog, uh, that one. Uh, that'll link to the dev2, yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I wanna call that out because that's not a best practice. Um, a lot of times we're using this when, when things are actually declarative. So I wanna give an example of when it's an appropriate time to use a non-null assertion operator. Um, in Angular. So go back to your code real quick. And I just want to like do this because I, I was fighting with a client about this and the problems <laughs> it causes. Um, all right, here where you declare title, get rid of that, um, get rid of initializing it to anything and just have it be title um, semicolon. All right, so you're going to get an error because we haven't defined it, right? All right, so go down into the ng on init lifecycle hook and set the value of title to be JSON is awesome. All right, so this is a really, really common pattern in Angular where a lot of times we won't be assigning a value to something until our lifecycle hook executes. Okay. okay, so let's go back up and see that TypeScript error. It's still there because TypeScript is not aware of Angular's lifecycle hooks. So this is a case where we would use that operator, that exclamation mark to say, hey, we know we're not declaring a value here. We will later on in our lifecycle hook. That is so an appropriate like, use case. Like, wait, no, I'm definitely doing this wrong. Uh, oh, do the exclamation mark and then type in the string. So exclamation mark after title. Uh, sorry, but before the colon. Oh, yeah. gotcha. There okay. We go. okay. I've, I've yes. never used this in uh, in TypeScript, so I'm, I'm learning yeah. today. Yeah, and so a couple things here. If you were to declare, if you were to assign a value to this in the constructor function, TypeScript can determine that it has a value. But a lot of times, again, in Angular, we're going to be doing these on lifecycle hooks. So this isn't OK it. to do it because it's telling TypeScript compiler, hey, we know this isn't defined. Do not use this as a way to get around TypeScript errors for when you may or may not have something defined. You will cause problems, and some consultant will come and clean up your code and cry themselves to sleep at night and drink <laughs> Oh. 
So I just want to call that out because it's something I've seen a lot. And like, yes, it's a way to get around the TypeScript compiler. But like I talk about my blog post, your goal should not be to get around the TypeScript compiler. The compiler, like TypeScript is there to help you catch errors that you might not realize you're creating. So work with it. Don't try and get around it. Understand the reasoning of, of what's going on under the hood. Um, so yes. just like I saw that in the chat. And I was like, no, 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 no. All right, let's <laughs> let's make, make sure we clarify here. Um, All right. Yeah, so, so a good example is like not typing any to get around stuff, even though we kind of did that with our event handler. But um, it's okay for now. Mike just out there trolling in the chat. Uh, so uh, lightning round of, of wrapping up because we are out of time. Yes. Everyone go and follow Jennifer on Twitter immediately or else. Uh, also, you can uh, always check out the show. We had live captions all day. Thank you to Amanda for hanging out with us. She's from White Coat Captioning. Very much appreciated. And that's made possible by our sponsors, Netlify, Fauna, Auth0, and Hasura, all kicking in to make this show more accessible. Make sure while you're on the site, you go and check out our schedule. We've got so much good stuff coming up. Remember, you can click this ad on Google Calendar to get a listings. Um, we have... Nathaniel Kenwa coming back next week, as well as Shandai Person. Um, we're going to be learning about IVR with Twilio. I'm so excited about that. Functional reactive style components. What? This is going to be great. I'm, I'm really excited for that. And then next week, we have uh, Ben Hong doing a takeover. He's going to do two episodes, uh, one on workflow automation and one on note taking with Obsidian. Both are going to be fascinating. Please, please, please come and check those out. They're going to be so much fun. Um, with that, Jennifer, is there anywhere people should go to check out uh, more about you or more about what we talked about today? Um, they can go to jenniferwadella.com. Um, NGConf is in a week, I think. Um, it will be online. So I am doing a talk on template-driven forms versus reactive forms. Um, so all sorts of content there. My blog is a little bit out of date. I have I just it's, have not been getting stuff posted to there. So it's more, currently um, down. It is. It's your fault. It's in Gatsby. I did, I did it. I don't fault. know. I did it. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but I do have a lot of blogging on Dev2. Um, so that's where most of my like current technical content is. OK. Let's, let's find See people. Did I get it wrong? No. Here you are. Here you are. OK. Go hit that out. Check it out. And that is all the time we have today, everybody. Jennifer, thank you so much for hanging out this day. This was an absolute blast. Chat, yes. as always, thank you for giving us some time. We're going to go find somebody to raid. We'll see you all next time. <laughs>